uh, maximum availability. If it's a car, you don't want it to rely on anything that's connected online. Uh, it needs to, uh, there is a demand for a uh, design for Six Sigmas, so it needs to be highly reliable. It's not easy to uh, obtain this reliability without uh, giving uh, the smartness or the compute power to the device itself and make it self-contained let alone missiles and other stuff that are self-contained and need to uh, handle uh, the, mich the, the mission uh, by its own. Data privacy has become, is a growing demand uh, in light of GDPR and other stuff. Um, information is uh, very small compared to, the real information that needs to be delivered is very small compared to the amount of data that is actually received by the sensors. There's an overwhelming excessive information coming from those edge devices that is unnecessary to extract the needed information at the end. And when you think of it, sometimes it's also mission dependent. So the same source of information carries different types of data and you don't want one data to mix with another. So data privacy is also a characteristic for the edge. Low latency, there are cases, not all of them, where you need to close the loop between sensing an action and for that you need small amounts of uh, small duration for the processing time and the decision making so that also takes uh, a, one of the major factors in edge devices and of course cost uh, eventually when things commoditize uh, the most dominant factor actually in uh, real devices is the, the cost structure. You need to uh, be able to sell them within the price range of what the customers are expected to uh, buy them. Uh, and that is a huge pressure, sometimes even more dominant than performance, on uh, what defines a device at the edge, unlike data center. Let's talk, look about, uh, let, let's look into a typical endpoint of, uh, of an edge device. So typically there is the physical world where you look in the analog domain, sometimes also digital, but most cases analog, analog domain where you have the sensing and actuation. You have some kind of transition to digital domain and then some processing and maybe decision making, either storage or connectivity to some other endpoint. Um, and then there is an energy source where you can uh, use this energy source uh, to power this entire device. Just as an example and to give a ballpark of, those, um, of each of those components, so the sensing element is ranging today. And again, this, these numbers are not the full range. It should not be treated as min-max numbers, but they give you a sense of what an edge device looks like. So $1 to $10 for the sensing element. A sensing device, um, a sensing device, uh, typical sensing device for for typical edge endpoints and actuation as well. Uh, the battery, which is, if it's a battery, it's sometimes powered by by other energy source. But again, ballpark of one uh, one or two dollars uh, on the low end and few dollars upper end uh, and the processing element, which is again the most uh, dominant part usually that takes the toll for uh, the entire platform and sometimes the connectivity takes its toll as well. From energy budget, it's uh, as shown here, the sensing element can carry most of the budget. It, it changes. The sensing element can carry most of the budget. There's a mistake here. I see it's 0.2 to 0.7 watts, of course. That's the connectivity element and uh, the, um, the energy of the digital processing, these two basically take most of the uh, energy for the platform in typical cases. And uh, the importance of designing them for low power in power sensitive uh, devices is a critical and fundamental aspect of uh, endpoints. Uh, and that's why in edge, the two dominant factors are energy and cost eventually when it commoditizes. So this is why these two parameters are uh, shown here and they will escort us when we talk about how to architect a solution that is uh, efficient and good enough for the edge.
just to zoom in on the uh, camera so sensors, so uh, this is a snapshot from uh, one of the research uh, and an analyst reports for camera sensor. This is ju just to show or to justify this number. You see that most of the volume is sub ten dollars today for uh, for uh, CMOS camera sensors. This is where we stand today with uh, the technology, and this shows why it's so domi why the processing element is so dominant because to uh, allow um, processing very high-end sensors you need something that in cost matches this level of cost while in capacity matches the capacity of what is needed to carry out the task. When you talk about the machine learning task you will see that the typical computers today are not up to the stand up to this. Uh, um, just a few more points uh, which are important and just um, stress out what I just mentioned. The market has commodities so that technology is now um, good enough to uh, quickly uh, expand and improve uh, from generation to generation. Higher resolutions which create uh, a factor of two to a factor of four in the uh, input stream and the higher frame rate which creates yet another factor from generation to generation. So we get an overall input bandwidth that can be in the gigabit uh, per second range. And this is what the digital processing uh, engine needs to uh, be able to handle. A critical point, and this is uh, kind of uh, the intro to uh, what architectures for deep learning are trying to achieve today. And in general, the computer architectures are trying to achieve today. Rule-based engines already achieve this. Is the, uh, is the fact that when you talk about edge devices, the most critical factor is not capacity. Because capacity is limited by the data stream that can be uh, driven from the sensors. And at the edge, you have only a few of them. So the workload is always limited. But the uh, efficiency is the only knob that you can play with in order to match a lower operational point. So when I talk about operational point, we can speak about, in, the, in this example, this is just an illustration, we can speak about watts, we can also speak about dollars, um, but in this case, when we talk about energy, so if you have certain operational point of a few watts, then the capacity is basically driven by the efficiency, tops per watt, and therefore, if you have uh, a certain efficiency, you get the capacity that this engine can drive. So um, if you take a certain uh, example, this is for a lower wattage, uh, you get some capacity. And if the um, efficiency is linear, if it's a constant efficiency, you will gain capacity as you increase operational point. Or the other way around, if you want to reduce the, the, oper the power, you will uh, degrade the capacity accordingly. Um, if it's uh, not that efficient, you will plateau somewhere. This is what happens to many devices that are designed for high scale and cannot uh, degrade um, from that point uh, onwards. So here, for example, you see an example where the efficiency is uh, deteriorating because the capacity is static. It has reached, achieved the maximum capacity and therefore the efficiency is uh, static. Another way to view this is uh, to view the scalability factor. The scalability factor is basically to look at the um, efficiency, how the efficiency changes over the operational point. So, for example, uh, in this uh, red case, the efficiency is static across all operational points. So this is the most scalable uh, case. Of course, when the scalability drops, uh, it's hard to scale so, for example, this uh, green example cannot scale from this operational point to this operational point. And the reason that I'm showing this is because efficiency and scalability are most fundamental for uh, realizing or measuring the uh, viability of an architecture for uh, edge devices. On the cloud, uh, on the contrary, this is less of an important measure. So this is um, the, dif the major difference between edge and cloud. When you talk about cloud, you have unlimited uh, workload. You have uh, multiple sources so you can aggregate uh, or batch, as we call it uh, in the machine learning domain. You can uh, 
make sure that you have enough capacity and release more resources to meet the capacity needed, even if the efficiency degrades somewhat. So of course, efficiency is important in both cases, but it's not the driving factor in this case. And the solution is distributed usually. There is usually a, a storage fabric, a connectivity fabric, and a, and, uh, and a compute fabric, which are decoupled from one another, and each scales by its own measures and by its own target. Uh, while on the other end, on the edge, the workload is limited, as I said, and the source is not distributed. And the, uh, what drives the uh, need is the resources that are available for the machine. It's self-contained and it's not distributed. So what you have is what you need to play with. Uh, and that's a critical factor in designing uh, uh, architectures for the edge. And as I said earlier, the bottom line here and the, the real takeaway is that the only knob to play with eventually when the resources are given is, is the efficiency factor. If we switch gears and talk about specifically, more, more specifically about machine learning at the edge, then we can take this uh, as an example. If we take a simple case of a, of a smart camera, which is very common today, uh, and we uh, look into uh, the economy of scale there, then you see that the typical case is that you take a camera, uh, streamlining it to, to the cloud is not possible in row. So typically it includes some kind of a processor that does uh, some level of encoding to uh, compress the data, simple data compression. And then it streamlines to the, ed uh, to the cloud, sorry, and uh, processed there. Uh, this is uh, quite costly, but more, or, um, more so it is uh, carrying uh, a whole uh, round trip delay and it requires to handle each edge device, each edge endpoint in the cloud as well. When you look about the, uh, when you look into the alternative, so an alternative would be to process or to partially process and digest the needed information and extract it at the camera level and then just deliver the insights and the outcomes to the, uh, f to the ex excessive processing at the data center. And that would, of course, result in much smaller cost, therefore would allow for a scalable system. And uh, um, of course, the other pr uh, virtues that we mentioned earlier are also inherent to that because this would serve for new opportunities and new use cases that are not available here. For example, if there needs to be some interaction between the user and the camera, then in this case, it would need to be meticulously designed to allow very low round trip delay. Here it is self-contained and uh, therefore latency becomes a, a factor in, that, in such cases when you want ear to mouth uh, delay that is given. Um, and of course, data privacy, which is sometimes um, neglected, uh, is in nowadays becoming more and more important uh, there are use cases that uh, disallow a deployment due to privacy and uh, there are more and more applications and specifically machine learning applications that are allowing uh, the privacy to be enhanced by deploying them close to the data, like blaring uh, the background of a scene uh, for reporters that are uh, reporting from out there and uh, similar cases. Uh, this is a nice view of um, where the classifier's evolution stands, thanks to Mark here. Um, uh, you see here the evolution uh, both over time, so time is uh, drawn, uh, shown here uh, and annotated on each of the, on each of the blobs, uh, and uh, also the different, uh, different architectures. What's interesting to show is an extraction and uh, contraction uh, nature here where in, in the beginning uh, the, um, the evolution was such that um, extractors were evolved to uh, give more accuracy over time uh, on the expense of more complexity or more gigaflops and larger, uh, larger uh, um, neural networks in terms of parameters. The sizes of the blobs are uh, of, the, of the of the small circles defined uh, 
the number of parameters uh, are indicative of the number of parameters. So uh, what you see is a trend to go with higher, uh, larger networks and higher uh, gigaflops. Uh, and eventually there is a sort of a trend back into the mainstream to a compromise between accuracy and, um, and gigaflops. This is um, an indication for the need for machine learning at the edge, one of the indications, and MobileNet, by the way, is one of the, the uh, initial uh, examples for that, where Google designed a, a network specifically to run on mobile devices. Um, and what's interesting to see here is, similarly to what happened in the mobile world, is that at the beginning of days when architectures were not able to deliver the needed power and the needed uh, value for uh, performance, uh, people designed models that are driven by the existing architecture. What we believe needs to happen, and what happened in the mobile world as well, is that eventually the architecture has overcome the obstacles of not being able to deliver the enough to deliver the, the needed performance, and models have not been designed to fit the architecture, but rather architecture have been built to fit the models. And that's what we are claiming needs to be done. And not just us, other people in the industry are, doing, are operating in the same direction. Uh, this is yet another slide, very famous one. I, I guess most of uh, the guys here from machine learning are familiar with it. It's a nice uh, indication for a very uh, often misobserved uh, virtue of one of the key uh, parameters. So in this uh, slide, we, we see everything in a sort of a linear scale, but this scale is highly nonlinear, and it's important to uh, understand that, that changing 1% in the accuracy is not uh, a linear uh, factor, and it's not as easy as changing or multiplying the model size, and sometimes it, multiplying the model size does not contribute to uh, accuracy as it uh, would have if, uh, if this would uh, have been uh, evolving in, an, in a linear manner. This is critical to understand because sometimes practical engineering is um, prevailing here in terms of building models that are adequate for um, the architectures that are available and therefore uh, they are not to be uh, overlooked. Few um, concluding observations that lead to the discussion about architectures and what are the properties of architectures for edge specifically in this domain. So eventually, um, a neural network is just a, a mapping function between an input and an output. You get an input, you have some function, and you get an output. So it's very simplistic, very naive. Um, but there's, there, are, there are a few product properties that are unique for machine learning applications, for neural networks specifically, that needs to be uh, highlighted and are critical when thinking of architecture that is a good fit for a neural network and it's different from what we all know from traditional architecture because we must ask ourselves what specializes a neural network from other algorithms because we have good DSPs, we have good GPUs and still there are um, different uh, limitations that define neural networks when deployed on those architectures. So one Critical observation is the fact that a typical neural network has a very lean control. It does not need to be controlled that uh, much, and there is no um, there is no data. The, the 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 flow of data is not um, governed by any uh, inline control and does not require run runtime control during processing. The other thing is that there is a huge dependency on the task that is. Um, that is being executed. So, for example, if you take this image, uh, one can think of uh, several tasks, and this is just a few that uh, I named here, but you can think of uh, various tasks that you can run on this input. Uh, when you think on typical algorithms, typically the, um, the algorithm that runs on the input is not that diverse when you think of the mapping between input to output. It, it is only that much that you can do between a certain given input and the output that you extract from it. And therefore, um, the uh, dynamics of this uh, function is 
is very high based on what you really want to achieve at the output. So uh, this is something very important to realize and requires first high programmability and second the fact that um, it is not that most of the program changes per task. Uh, so uh, and the other thing is that the parameter domain, which is basically what creates the program, so to speak, in, in a neural network, is huge compared to the input. So uh, unlike a typical algorithm where the number of parameters is fairly small compared to the size of the input, here the, the parameter domain is huge um, and is typically um, um, a huge uh, space of uh, filtering of the rich input domain uh, that is typically overspecified. And the output in many cases, again, I'm not talking here about the, the full set of cases like GANs and, and, and the likes, uh, is um, extremely compact and uh, the uh, is a compact description of, of the input given the function that, uh, or the test that was selected to be carried out. So bottom line is that um, the neural network carries high sensitivity to the application, very high sensitivity to the application, uh, and um, the uh, diversity in, the, in this function is high, is very huge, is very large. Just to uh, give um, an example, and I try to avoid uh, too much. The, the technical stuff is in uh, in the next uh, lecture, so I try to avoid too much. Uh, formulations and, and mathematics, but uh, just to give a sense uh, of, the, of, of the amount of calculations and, and the number of compute needed. So um, it's the important observation here with relation to the edge is that the number of weights does not scale down when you move to the edge. And the overall compute only scale by batch size, assuming that you use be, uh, batching. So basically, the uh, native application or the native compute for, for the algorithm does not shrink when you move from the data center to the, to the edge. The same uh, set of uh, parameters is needed, which is, as we said, very large, and the same amount of compute is needed. So this is important to realize that we cannot allow ourselves, when we try to design an architecture for the edge, to dismiss this uh, this factory. We cannot scale it down. This needs to be kept at the same scale. And just uh, not to neglect the software side of things, uh, what Neural Network is basically calling for is a rethink of how the software is built on top of the hardware. In general, uh, the rule-based um, paradigm that was uh, with us for the generations of, of compute since the, the 50s of the, of the uh, former century is basically completely irrelevant and, and not a good way for describing a neural network. So th therefore, an, a description of a neural network in terms of a C language or a rule-based uh, designed uh, language is very cumbersome and very awkward. Uh, and these uh, differences they call for a change in the way that you describe uh, the uh, the software to the uh, hardware machine. So um, in the case of a rule-based, uh, what we have today in the case of a rule-based uh, um, program, you have code which defines the rule. Uh, it's uh, experience agnostic. It does not need to see more uh, examples to determine how it behaves. It determined upfront, uh, and uh, it's handwritten, basically. The rules are handwritten, and it, the structure is custom. When we talk about um, a neural network uh, program, it's basically a rigid structure. It's completely the other way around. A rigid structure, no control, so no data flow, but it does need uh, to see examples and to be trained, as, as it's called, and it's experience-oriented. So the code, the, the code itself, which is the weights or the, the, info, the, the parameters for the code, is practically self-generated in a way. So let's talk about computer architectures and what are they. So I, I guess all of you know the guy on the left. 
the guy on the right, sorry, but the guy on the left is less, uh, I think, less familiar. This is uh, Jeff Hinton, you know, and this is uh, John von Neumann. So the reason I, I've shown them uh, side by side is that um, the computer architectures that we are familiar with today uh, have mostly be, uh, coming from this guy. The, there are von Neumann architectures and all of them, CPUs, GPUs, RISC processors eventually, are inherently uh, von Neumann architectures and they are all built from uh, basically from rule, four rule-based uh, programs. They are good, very good for executing general purpose data uh, processing where the, um, the branching of the code and the decision being made along the, um, along the uh, execution path are being made on the fly and for that these uh, machines are uh, perfect. However, as we just said, for machine learning, this is not a good uh, solution. It works, but as we said earlier, if you we want it good for the edge, we must be uh, more efficient. Another observation, which uh, is kind of an indication that time has come, is the uh, Makimoto's wave. This is uh, a famous uh, observation from a Sony chairman that uh, there is kind of a pendulum uh, behavior between standardization and customization. Um, and we are on the verge, uh, basically, of the next uh, round, I would say, of the pendulum, where um, the neural network applications are giving the incentive for a new architecture to come and to emerge um, in order to address the, 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 the huge need. Uh, so this is a typical von Neumann architecture. As you see, it has an input device, an output device, and an, uh, an attached memory unit. And the thing is that, <coughs> sorry, that rule-based algorithms, as we said, are driven by control, and therefore you see that control is a critical factor in this machine, and the um, architecture is control-oriented. So everything scales up with control, this is also a, a very famous uh, observation from Horowitz uh, 2014 uh, showing the huge overhead of control on the actual operation. Now, this is really what all von human machines more or less carry uh, as an overhead. Disregard the actual numbers, just the ratios, the numbers are for a specific technology node, but the point is that this is okay. Why are we okay with it? Because eventually this is driven by control. We need this control. The control is an inherent part of any rule-based uh, machine. And of course, it changes a bit when you talk about the uh, SAMD, the uh, SAMD architectures and others. And I'm not going to go into all these uh, variants, but the point is that control is a major part of the uh, machine. And since control is a major part of the machine, it carries a huge toll on energy, on area, etc. And when we talk about efficiency, if we just said that neural network does not need control, it needs lean control or practically no control, you can avoid uh, all this overhead without, bur without burdening the application. And actually, that's one way to regain efficiency. So one way to look at it is to look at the three components that uh, compose any architecture, memory, compute, and control. And just as an example, this is the case of the scaling of um, a QHD, for example, a one, stream, one stream of QHD at 30 frames per second. The, the figures are deliberately um, uh, obsolete from this uh, diagram, but, but just the ratios that show that, for example, when you scale from a QHD one stream to four stream, what gets uh, higher is more compute same control and same memory. This is, again, an example of a neural network running on such a source and, w and the way that it scale ups in terms of the demand from the architecture. I'm sorry. So if you scale it, for example, in the domain of, um, of the resolution, the input architecture, as we said, we don't want to compromise on the edge, on anything that is edge-oriented. So you see that... Um, Memory toll is, there is a small memory toll, zero toll on control, and a larger memory, a larger toll on compute. 
And finally, sorry, it goes back all the time. Uh, and finally, if you take all of them, then full HD, uh, so also res both resolution and number of streams. So no change on control, as you see for all the cases, a toll on memory that is growing and a toll on compute that is growing faster. So this gives a guide, for example, how to design an architecture that is properly uh, aligned with the needs for the task. Unlike von Neumann architectures, which would have a huge uh, increase here on this uh, vector then, and an, an equally uh, um, acceleration on the memory and on the compute, here the case is different. The, the acceleration on memory is slower than the acceleration on compute and the acceleration on con control is practically zero. Again, just to revisit this convolution uh, as a test case, you can think of mu uh, multiple strategies on how to tackle this uh, in the architecture domain. For example, you can think of it as a compute limited uh, strategy when you uh, have a certain amount of compute and then what it, what it renders is uh, reusing the available compute and therefore the memory bandwidth should guarantee uh, enough bandwidth to uh, allow maximum utilization of the available compute and the storage capacity needs to be accounted for now because all of the sudden uh, you need to store, you cannot process on the fly and you need to store uh, all the, uh, the needed information uh, in, in, in order to uh, feed this uh, compute and therefore the storage energy becomes critical. On another case, if you take a weight uh, bandwidth limited uh, strategy, that means that uh, you have only a limited bandwidth to uh, retrieve weights, for example, and then in this case uh, you would like to minimize uh, the weight read. In this case uh, you would like to use the weights that you have already read across a larger domain of the input and therefore you need to be able to access all this uh, input domain uh, and input buffering is needed in order to allow uh, to access all this uh, input. And the third strategy, and this is not the last, of course there, there are many, I just uh, picked three, uh, we, we, which each would yield a different architecture by the way, or slightly different architecture. Um, so uh, an input buffer limited strategy would uh, maximize the input usage. So you would like to uh, digest whatever input that you get. Uh, it requires, requires larger in intermediate memory because then you need more scratch bed. You need to uh, um, compute more intermediate results at a time. And then intermediate memory energy becomes a critical factor. So each has a trade-off. The big and major question, which I'll not answer today about how we did it, but um, the big and major question is what are the balance between all those and how you make one solution that fits all and, and addresses the problem of being both efficient in energy and in cost. I, I only treated here the energy factor because it's a more technical aspect, but of course, co of course cost is uh, this, uh, an equally important factor in the overall solution. Um, and just uh, before we conclude and uh, reaching conclusion, um, so this is, um, as we are now here in the, this uh, small meetup, there is, uh, ISSCC is taking place in the other end of the world and this is an early uh, insight from the ISSCC of this year. I have neglected to discuss about the uh, numerical representation which Alex uh, will talk about later on thoroughly, uh, but this is also another vector of uh, description uh, of the machine that is running uh, the uh, machine, the, the uh, algorithm at the edge. Um, you see here a survey of different papers on uh, the different efficiencies of solutions measured at teraops per watt. Uh, from different tiers, mainly interesting to, to view the new ones coming from this year uh, conference. Um, I would ignore the one bit, but at least uh, the green and the yellow ones are interesting. Uh, 
So this is where uh, kind of the state of the art of where the industry stands. I'll give you another observation, which is important, what wasn't shown here on the slide, but um, when you talk about the human machine, they actually, one can prove that they plateau, plateau at around 100 gigaops per watt uh, for uh, their efficiency. It's hard to uh, overcome this. In, at log scale, of course, 100, 200 doesn't really matter here. That, that's where a, a, a classic von Neumann machine with all the tricks and firearms uh, can uh, typically reach today. Uh, and you see that the industry is uh, striding towards an order of magnitude higher. Uh, just as a summary uh, slide, I would say that and I tried to hint to that earlier, that um, I think that we are seeing a transition, or we will be seeing a transition from model-driven architectures to architecture-driven models. Um, when I'm talking about models, I'm talking about neural network models. So um, I believe that, like what happened in the smartphone world, uh, where at the beginning there was a shrink towards uh, perfection of uh, efficiency, and then when we determined how to build an efficient machines, then we scaled it up to uh, entertain the real need and to uh, maximize the capacity for the given use cases. And that's what, we will, what I believe uh, will be the uh, future of um, machine learning architecture eventually. And I think today we are around here. Last but not least, um, as Mark mentioned, what we are doing here we're trying to build a chip that is uh, specialized for deep learning. Uh, we see that the trend of specialized architecture is uh, fundamental and imperative to enable this uh, revolution. We uh, try to be the ones delivering the infrastructure for uh, edge devices and machine learning at the edge. And of course, uh, we, see that we see ourselves as an, a complete solution company, so we deliver it with a comprehensive SDK with seamless integration to existing frameworks. It's our own architecture, so it's not something built of existing building blocks uh, designed specifically for neural networks. And as I said, what we described earlier is where we focus. We focus on efficiency. We focus on taking all these insights that we mentioned and trying try to bake them into our solution, make it programmable, and deliver it as scalable uh, as possible. And with that, I'll thank you. Uh